Hi everyone and thanks for staying. I know that, um, that I'm not everyone's favourite person to talk to so I appreciate that you've hung around. Uh, so, yes. I'm just going to add if anyone, I understand this is a very um, sort of sensitive issue so if anyone would like to leave the room you're more than welcome to. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, many of you would recognise uh, this gentleman, even if it's not from the Greater Newcastle advertisements, it's from his great role as a comedian in the 90s, Jerry Seinfeld. And uh, Jerry Seinfeld uh, talks about some research that was done on public speaking and that public speaking is actually the number one fear that most people um, have in life and, um, and that's quite possible here today. And, uh, and I, and, but the number two thing that was the biggest fear is talking about death. And what Jerry says about that is what that actually means is that if you go to a funeral, you're much, much prefer to be in the casket than the person doing the eulogy, which I think is uh, slightly concerning. But today I am going to talk about death, but I'm going to also talk about life and I'm going to talk about how important it is to plan both of those things. Um, why can I talk about this? And, and I think this is an important thing to know. Um, I'm not a person with a brain tumour and, and I acknowledge that and I recognise this is hard for some people to listen to. Uh, but I am a critical care nurse and I have worked in uh, the health system in critical care areas for 25 years. Um, my focus at the moment in my work is in the last weeks of people's lives um, and I see lots and lots of people who are concerned and don't know what to do and don't know what they should be thinking about at these times. Uh, I've also worked for a long time as an organ and tissue donation coordinator and that was looking after people who died sudden and unexpected deaths and, um, and needed lots of support around making decisions around organ and tissue donation. Uh, I've done a fair bit of bereavement counselling in my time. I find one of the biggest parts of my role is being a, fa a patient and a family advocate. So finding out what people's wishes are and making sure that we're respecting them in times of critical illness and that we're looking after people as best as we can. And one of the things that I also want to make sure we're not doing is providing burdensome or non-beneficial treatments to people that aren't improving the quality of their life, but we're doing things for, um, for other reasons which, which may not always be in the person's best interests. And I know that talking about death is uncomfortable. Um, the unfortunate news for every single person in this room is that life is a sexually transmitted disease and the mortality rate is 100%, whether we like it or not. So, um, so it is something that we need to have a think about. So what are the benefits of planning ahead? Um, and, and I'm talking about planning ahead for all things that might be possible. Um, I have planned ahead and, and I haven't been diagnosed with a life-limiting illness of any sort. So the benefits of planning ahead are you can have a say in your estate where that goes, who it goes to, and how it's managed. You can have a say in your medical treatment, what is acceptable to you, what's not acceptable to you. You can make sure that your family know your wishes, they know what you want. You can have a little bit of peace of mind that some of the control over your life will remain in that your wishes are known and that your family can try to make sure that those wishes are followed to the best of our ability. You will do your family an enormous um, favour by having conversations and planning and talking about what might happen if you find yourself in a critical condition in a hospital for any reason, whatever it might be. And, of course, my greatest interest, of course, is that we can provide better end-of-life care to people when we know what they want when we know what they've planned for, when we know their wishes and we know what's important to them. So one of the first things we all need to consider about is writing a will. And the important thing to know about writing a will is that it's only valid after you have died. So nothing that's written in a will is relevant to any member of a health service until after you're dead. So, so what's written in your will about whether or not you want this treatment or that treatment is irrelevant for us. It sits with your lawyer, we don't know what it says, and no one is going to read your will in a hospital environment. The will is about estate planning. It's about what's going to happen with your belongings. Anyone over the age of 18 years old should write a will. 
It should be reviewed at least every five years or when there's a major change in your life, such as divorce or children or buying a house or any one of those things. Lots of people say, well, I don't have anything, so I don't need to have a will. But you might be surprised some of the things that you do have. So you might have a dog or a child or a favourite bonsai that you want your great niece to have or rings or jewellery or any number of things that might be important and might cause problems for your family if they're fought over after your death. So think about some of the things that you might have that might be important because they're the things that we can put in wills. And I'm sure that every single one of you has known a family who have been fighting over a will and, um, and it can cause a lot of problems. If you don't have a will, it's called dying into state and, uh, and that means that any significant other can have a claim on your estate. So remember that person you had a relationship with 10 years ago and you said that they were the love of your life and you don't see them anymore? If you don't have a will, they have a significant reason to claim on your estate because you had a relationship with them. So I think it's important to recognise these documents are there for a reason so that your wishes can be heard and, and you can try to have some say over that. And we all have families and we can't pick them and sometimes they're better than others and some families are very, very complex and families often become more complex after someone has died. So having a will, having something documented is an important part of your future planning ahead. Other things that we need to think about are powers of attorney. And many people will come to me in the hospital and say, this is my son and he's my power of attorney. And that's great. But powers of attorney, again, are irrelevant to me in the hospital environment. So a power of attorney is someone who is nominated to manage your financial affairs. They don't have anything to do with healthcare. They're only there to manage your finances. So there's two types of power of attorney. A power of attorney, uh, just a straight power of attorney, is someone who can go to your bank and get money out to pay the electricity bill for you because you can't do it. For example, my husband is in America today and this morning he said to me, can you go to the bank for me and get some money out to pay a customer? And I said, no, because you didn't sign the power of attorney paperwork. And he said, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I said, I did, but you forgot to remember that. Yeah, great. Um, but there's another type of power of attorney and that's an enduring power of attorney. So an enduring power of attorney is different because an enduring power of attorney is the only person who can manage your affairs when you no longer have capacity. So the difference is a power of attorney, my husband, he's overseas, I can do anything for him if I had that piece of paper signed in terms of his financial management. If, however, he was to have a terrible accident overseas, he was to develop dementia, he was to have some sort of injury where he no longer had the capacity to make financial decisions, unless I was appointed as his enduring power of attorney, I would not be able to do that. So the enduring part of it means that if you have an inability to have the capacity to manage that, then only the enduring person can do it for you. Does that make sense? Yep. Great. So... All of us should have that stuff sorted out. The next thing we're going to talk about is enduring guardi guardians and substitute decision makers. So we all uh, know that when we go into hospital, they ask us about who's the person responsible or who's, who's going to make decisions for you. And many of us will just choose our spouse and say that that's the person who we're going to rely upon to make um, decisions for us um, or, or help out if the hospital needs to talk to someone. An enduring guardian is someone who is legally appointed in, um, by you and, and a lawyer to make healthcare decisions when you're unable to make them. There are formal and informal arrangements about that and the informal arrangements are normally those ones that we often see in hospitals where we say, oh, my husband's going to make any decisions for me, but it hasn't been legally um, cleared by a lawyer. Um, the important thing to remember about enduring guardians is they are only able to make medical decisions for you if you are unable to make them for yourselves. So an example of this is I met a man a couple of years ago who had to have what we call non-invasive ventilation. So he had a tight mask on his face that was pushing air into his lungs and he hated it. He absolutely hated having that mask on his face. And I said to him, well, why are you having it? You don't have to do this. And he said, oh, my son's my enduring guardian. And he said, I have to. And I said, no, 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 no. 
you know, you have the capacity and you are able to make decisions for yourself. So these people, enduring guardians, only make decisions for you when you no longer have the capacity to make them yourself. That's important to know. But they can make any decisions for you when you've lost capacity regarding your lifestyle, your health and your medical decisions. So that might include whether you have to go to an aged care facility, um, whether we need to get some assistance in to help you staying at home, all sorts of things they can help with. Um, and they're there to act in your best interests. So how do you choose that person and who is that person for you? Well, I can tell you it's not my husband for me. And I think that's really important. And it's also important to remember it may not be your children. Because does anyone here want to see their parent die? No. Does anyone here want to see their husband or their spouse die? No. So an enduring guardian, the best person, is not always your husband or wife or your child. Sometimes it might be a trusted friend. My enduring guardian is one of my best friends with my husband. They must make those decisions together because I don't trust him to completely act in my best interests if something terrible happens to me because the last thing in the world he wants is to lose his wife. But I trust my best friend who I've worked with for many, many years in the health sector to know what's acceptable to me and what that outcome might look like. So I trust her to guide him to do the right thing for me. Is that making sense? So we need to think about who are the people that we trust and how can we make sure that they understand what's important to us, what our wishes are, what our goals are, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So thinking about who those people are in your life is a really important thing to do. Advanced care planning and advanced care directives are also a very important part of planning for your future. And these are also known as living wills, depending on, on who you talk to. In America, we often think about these as living wills. Um, and basically what advanced care plans and advanced care directives are, they're a plan for your future medical care. They are to consider your values, beliefs and wishes. They're often done in conjunction with your GP or your other health professionals or your specialist. Um, and it's about usually what treatments, medical treatments, you would like that can prolong your life, what you wouldn't like. And, um, and, and whether or not you document that depends on whether it's an advanced care plan or an advanced care directive. So the planning itself is a really lovely way to think about and talk to your enduring guardian or your family or whoever it might be about your values and your wishes if you were to get really sick. The problem with advanced care planning alone is it doesn't really guarantee that your family's going to follow it. Because as I mentioned before, none of us want our loved ones to die. That's not what we want. And so there can be family disagreements. There can be families not ready to let go. There can be the case where you might have talked about a scenario in advanced care planning and say, oh, I don't want to ever do this. But the current situation isn't quite what you were talking about. And so it's a bit hard for families always to know whether this is exactly what the situation that you were talking about. Um, so, so advanced care planning itself is more about the talking and, um, and advanced care directives is more about the legal requirement associated with that. Why is this important? Why is it something that we need to be thinking about? Almost 85% of Australian people will die with some sort of chronic illness. And of those people, 50% of them are not going to be able to talk or express their wishes when they're close to dying. So the time is not when you're close to dying to be talking about this stuff. It's today. It's tomorrow. It's next week. It has to be sooner, not when you get critically unwell or when you have a terrible accident or something like that. And every single one of us can benefit from thinking about your healthcare choices and who they would want to speak for them if they were unable to speak for themselves. So the advanced care directive is the legal side of advanced care planning. So it's about writing down your advanced care plan into a document that's been witnessed by usually your medical officer and usually it's signed by yourself and sometimes you can get a family member to sign them as well. 
It records specific wishes about the treatments you want if something life-threatening happens to you. And, um, and it's a very useful tool for, the, um, for your substitute decision makers, your family, your spouse, to know this is what you want at this really difficult time. There is no specific advanced care directive form in New South Wales that you must use. So in actual fact, you can write it on the back of your cornflake box and get your GP to sign it if you want to. So there's no specific form, but New South Wales Health, if you Google New South Wales Advanced Care Directive, there is a form available on the internet that you can fill that out. Um, and as I said, it's very useful, but the problems that we face in our hospital system with these tools is, is it valid? Is it relevant today? Is this, is this what this Advanced Care Directive was written for? Did the person have the capacity to write it? Well, we presume if there is one that they did have the capacity to write it. Was it written voluntarily or was it written because the son wants to inherit the millions of dad and he was millions of dad and it was written under duress? And, and of course, in the hospital system, we don't know the answer to that. But that's why we get our medical practitioners or an independent person to sign those forms. Is it clear and specific details about the treatments to accept or refuse? And is it current extending to the circumstances at hand? So this is where things start to get a little bit muddy. So for example, I might say, having been an intensive care nurse for 20 years of my life, that I never ever want to be a patient in an intensive care unit because I don't want to have all those tubes and I don't want to have all those machines that go ping and I don't want that as part of my advanced care planning. However, I walk out of here today and I get hit by a car and the ambulance come and they take me to the hospital and Dr Christie releases some pressure on my head from, from being hit by the car and we all know that I'm going to have a good recovery from that. So would my advanced care directive be relevant for that episode? It's very hard for people to know. So this is why we have our substitute decision makers and our enduring guardians and the people that we talk to to know, well, if Jeanette's going to recover from this, then it's okay for Dr Christie to do this surgery on her head. But if he thinks she's going to end up with significant disability or significant functional decline after that, Jeanette probably wouldn't want it. So this is why we have to have conversations now about what we might need. And it must be witnessed and it must be co-signed, as I mentioned to you. Part of the challenges, of course, with writing at any advanced care directive, and especially for someone like me, who is reasonably young, and, um, and, and without any current disease, um, long-term disease diagnosis, is what am I asking for and what am I looking for and what do I need to think about? So my advice to everyone is if you have been given some form of diagnosis, then learn about it. Learn about your illness, learn about your health and learn about what you might expect. All of us should think about whether we have our affairs in order. Do we have a will? Have we written down what a statement of our wishes might be? I have a, my family has a quite a complex, my husband's family has quite a complex stepson, stepchildren, blah, 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 thing going on with multiple children, multiple stepchildren, multiple estranged children. And I always think to myself, this is going to be really tough when something happens. What they've done is written a will and a statement of wishes. You know, we'd really like Jeanette to take that lovely picture for, that we bought in Prague 30 years ago because she's always loved that picture. So not only is there a will, but there's a statement of what they wish to happen with their estate when they go. So do I have my affairs in order? Who's going to speak to me when I can't speak for myself? What are my goals today, next month, next year, with my health, and, and what am I hoping to achieve? What medical treatments are acceptable to me and which ones aren't? What functional ability is acceptable to me? Am I okay with being incontinent? Am I okay with being permanently uh, bed-bound and needing 24-hour nursing care? Am I okay with not being able to play bowls anymore? Am I okay with not being able to shower myself anymore? What functional ability is okay for me? 
And I guess one of the last things is where and with whom would I like to be cared for when I'm dying? And, um, and that's something that clearly comes a bit later, but it's important to think about where do I want to be and what's important for me? So one of the biggest challenges that anyone has when it comes to advanced care, writing in advanced care plans or talking about them is what, what actually, um, what do all these medical treatments mean? You know, what does it mean to have CPR and breathing assistance and all these things? And I thought I'd just touch on what some of these things mean to try to help you if you were ever thinking about these things in your planning. So I just mentioned previously the gentleman I told you about who had the non-invasive breathing machine. So he had a mask attached to his face. It can go over the, just the nose or it can go over the mouth and the nose. And, um, and lots of people have these in the community for sleep apnea where they might have them and they just use them at night time. So that's called non-invasive ventilation is what we call it in the hospital. And it makes people who are breathless often feel much better. And people who have sleep apnea can start sleeping through the night when they have non-invasive breathing. Invasive breathing assistance involves putting a what we call an endotracheal tube down the throat into the lungs for someone and a ventilator does all of the breathing for them. So the ventilator pushes air in and takes the air out and the intensive care doctors and nurses adjust the ventilation depending on the function of the person's lungs. You can be ventilated and initiating the breaths by yourself, so you start the breath off. Some people don't initiate any breaths and they don't have their breathing centre is not working properly and therefore the machine delivers all the breaths for them and controls all the breathing in and out. Um, and people can be attached to these machines for very short periods of time, 24 hours, um, they can be on the machine, six hours they can be on the machine, or for very long periods of time. And people who have very high spinal injuries may be ventilator dependent, so they're on a ventilator for the rest of their lives. So you can have invasive ventilation for a very long period of time. The intensive care unit I spoke about is my, it's my um, learning ground where I learnt my trade. Uh, this is the place where we provide very, very sophisticated organ support and monitoring of patients. So we usually take people there because they need blood pressure management, they have difficulties with their breathing or some of their organs are failing. We use machines, we use drugs to ma and we use fluids and different things to manage hearts, the lungs, the kidneys and also people who have had large amounts of surgery. But intensive care is usually only useful for people when we have a condition that is reversible. And that's the important thing to remember about ICU is you should only go there if we can reverse your current problem that you have. Uh, many of you would know people on dialysis because lots of our community are on dialysis and that's when the kidneys are not filtering the blood properly and people can go on dialysis to remove the excess water and the excess waste that their kidneys are not filtering through as urine. Um, and there are people who are on dialysis for many, many years and some of them end up having kidney transplants and some of them end up just staying on dialysis until their death comes. Artificial nutrition and fluids. This is very useful when people have swallowing affected by their disease. So many people with motor neuron diseases can find that they actually can't swallow effectively anymore. So we might artificially feed them through a, a tube that goes either through the nose and into the stomach or what we call a peg tube which sits directly into the stomach. Um, it's not useful to artificially feed people or provide artificial hydration when someone's actually dying. Um, and that's not something we usually try to do. But it is very useful when people have an extended period of life ahead of them and we can provide them with nutritional support. And the big thing that we always talk about is cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR. And people talk about CPR and NFR and all of those things are about having... Uh, having CPR when someone's heart stops. So it's used when people are so sick that their heart stops beating. Uh, it is repeatedly pushing down upon the chest to try to mimic the heart doing its job of pumping. So the pushing down on the chest tries to push the blood around the body like it would normally do if the heart was still working. Uh, we usually have to intubate the person, so we usually have to put the artificial airway down and we have to do the breathing for the person when their heart has stopped. We can also use electrical currents from a defibrillator to try to restart the heart, but that's only when the heart has gone into an electrical abnormality, not a time when it's actually just stopped pumping altogether. 
and we use medication during CPR to try to restart the heart and we put that directly into the veins to see if we can get the heart pumping again. So does CPR work? That's a really interesting question because it works on the TV and you all would have seen it on the TV and there was some research done that said that 90% of people who got CPR on the TV woke up looking glamorous with their lipstick perfect and fell in love with the doctor and lived happily ever after. In actual fact, that's not the case. So in our hospital environments, uh, 10 to 15% of people who have a cardiac arrest where their heart stops working, 10 to 15% of people will survive with the CPR that happens in the hospital environment with the trained health professionals around them. In our community, it's more like 5% of people will survive. So this is not something that has a hugely successful outcome because usually the reason that people's heart stops is because they're really sick and that's important for people to know. Do you have to have it? No, you don't. But you don't have to consent for it either. So it's not something that you can say, don't do CPR to me and then you fall down playing bowls today. People aren't going to come up and check that you want it. They're just going to do CPR to you. In the hospital environment, you are also allowed to say to the medical teams, I do want it or I don't want it. The important thing to know is the medical teams don't have to do it. That's do not resuscitate, yes. So, so do not resuscitate are important conversations for, team, for, for people to have with their family, saying I wouldn't want to have that. It's important that those conversations then happen with the medical staff if you come into hospital so that they know what you want and it's important that we write that down on a hospital approved form so that everyone else knows that too. So what we want to do is make sure that we all understand what people want. Um, but it is something that at some stages medical teams will actually say, well, we're not going to do it because we know that it's not going to change the outcome for this person. So, so it's an important conversation to have, but in the end it's going to be medically decided as to whether we start it, stop it, keep going with it, or how we manage that. But we want to know the wishes of the person so that we consider them at all times. Does that make sense? We've got time for questions after. Are there side effects of having CPR? I looked after a, a lovely young lady. She was only 35 recently, and she said, I really want to have CPR. And I said, that's great. And she said, but I don't want to have CPR if I'm going to have any um, kind of brain damage after that. And, and that's fine for her to say that. But what we need to understand about CPR is it means that the blood has stopped flowing around the body. And we know that within two to three minutes of the blood stopping flowing around the body that there are effects on the brain. And the longer that the blood's not flowing around the body, the greater the effects on the brain. So when we start CPR on someone, anyone in our hospital environment, we don't know whether we're starting it for one minute or whether we're going to be doing it for one hour or two hours. We don't know. And so we make these decisions in the hope that we're doing the right thing for the person. But there are side effects of CPR. They also include things like cracked ribs because we have to provide a lot of pressure. So there are side effects to this. We try to always do the right thing. It's not always a better outcome for people. The other thing that people need to think about when we're talking about advanced care planning is organ and tissue donation. And I told you at the beginning that I have an interest in organ and tissue donation. But this is something, again, that we can think about while we're fit and while we're well and whether donating organs or tissues is something that we would want to do after our death. And if you would like to do that, you can go to the Donate Life website or to Medicare and you can fill out organ and tissue donation forms. And there are organ and tissue donation coordinators available at John Hunter. So they're all the things we have to think about when we're thinking about planning for our future. So it's quite a lot. And then we've done it and we've filled out our advanced care plan and we've got an enduring guardian and we've, got, um, we've told the doctors whether we want CPR and we've done all of these wonderful things. So what do we do with all these bits of paper and these conversations that we've got? Well, we should keep a copy of them. I always say to people when I do it, stick one on the fridge, stick one next to the front door, put one in your bag, put one in your partner's bag, give one to your kids, give them to everyone. 
because you want everyone to know what your wishes are who might possibly be the person who's with you if something terrible happens. And what we don't want to do is you to come into us in the intensive care unit three days later and go, look, Mum had one of these plans and I just lost it. But it says here that she didn't want you to put any tubes in and she didn't want you to do any of this stuff and you've done all those things. So can you take them all out now? Because that makes that's really hard to do that. We can do that and we will do it. But it's just important to remember, if you've got these documents, you need to give them to us and we need to know where they are so that we can try to follow your wishes and, um, and do that for you. But just because you've done it doesn't mean it's over. Sorry about that. Because you have to review it. Because what's acceptable to me today might not be acceptable to me when I'm 80 years old. And it might not be acceptable to me in five years so we need to constantly review, are our advanced care directives still valid? Is the stuff I've written down still right? Do I need to go and have another conversation with my enduring guardians because I've changed my mind about this? I don't want to be an organ and tissue donor anymore. I don't want to go to ICU anymore. I don't want to have that ventilation anymore. Things have changed for me. And I know that before I said that I wasn't happy if I couldn't shower myself, but now I am happy with that. And I'm okay with having treatments if I can just still have some time with my grandchild. So we need to think about the times change, circumstances change, function changes, and therefore our thoughts about what we want and what we don't want will change with time. And we need to constantly review that. Now my last two slides are around palliative care and some of the options that they include. And this is, of course, something that's very, very close to me. And I think it's really important that palliative care does not mean that you're going to die tomorrow. And lots of people think, once you've gone into palliative care, you're going to be dead tomorrow or you're going to be dead next week. And that is not what palliative care is about. Palliative care work with people, and sometimes they work with people for five or ten years who have life-limiting illnesses. These are the people that try to bring together all of the aspects of your health care, all of the aspects of your quality of life to try to make what time you have as comfortable as it possibly can be. It's for people with any problem with life-limiting illness and their job is to look after all of your symptoms like pain and nausea or um, breathlessness or any one of those things as well as ensuring that your spirituality, your needs, your goals of care are always well established and always well looked after. I know a lot of people are afraid of the words palliative care, but I strongly encourage you to realise that these are people who are there to help you as much as we possibly can, and not just in your last days or your last week of life, but in fact can add substantially to the rest of your life. And one of the things that we often offer at the time when we talk about palliative care is an ambulance plan. And many people don't know about the ambulance plan, but an ambulance plan enables the ambulance services who come to your house to take you to hospital if something terrible has happened to know what your wishes are. So it's another layer of advanced care planning and advanced care directives. If you don't want to go to hospital and you're dying, you can actually write this in an ambulance palliative care plan. They can come to your house, they can administer medications to make you comfortable and they can leave you in your house where you are. Or they can come to your house and it says in your care plan that you want to be transported to John Hunter Hospital and they can transport you to John Hunter Hospital. So palliative care plans are useful tools to help the ambulance to know what your planning and your goals of care are. And again, anyone who's going into a palliative care or working with palliative care, I think it's useful to think about filling out these plans. So my take-home message for you is think about the people that you trust, think about the people who you would want to make decisions for you if you are no longer able to make them for yourself. Make sure they know what you want, understand who you are and understand what's important to you and ask them to formally be the person who helps make decisions for you if you cannot make them for yourself. That, to me, is singularly the most important thing that you can take away from what I've told you today. And I'll leave it at that.